The, the next speaker, we're really, really honored to be able to listen to Professor John Gardner, who's gonna speak for about 15, 20 minutes, followed by a little bit of discussion based on, on the chat. He's the um, Leverhulme Research Fellow at Anglia Ruskin University, where he's engaged in this really fascinating project entitled, you should look it up, it's really great, entitled Engineering Romanticism in 18th and 19th century lit literature and culture, which is an innovative program which um, investigates the connections between engineering and literary cultures in the first half of the 19th century. So what this project seeks out to do is to ask how engineers and writers engaged in ideas about the economy, revolutionary experimentation, and then transmission of power between the late 1790s and 1851, of course, the Great Exhibition and how the drive to create new machines affected the way people thought about their worlds, but also how they wrote about their worlds. But today, I'm really thrilled to say he's going to be talking to a paper simply entitled Gaslight. Over to you, uh, John. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to thank Pat and Harriet Watt for organising this celebration um, of 200 Years of Mechanics Institutes and also the Leverhulme Trust for helping get me the funds to do research in this area. Okay, so today, gaslight is now mainly used as a verb to describe someone trying to dement their partner into insanity. And that usage comes from Patrick Hamilton's 1938 neo-Victorian drama of the same title, which shows gaslight as a dirty, disreputable technology that firmly belongs in the past. When Hamilton wrote his play, the heyday of gaslight was over due to the electric lamp, although remnants lived on in households and streets until the second half of the 20th century. However, at the start of the 19th century, gas was readily adopted. As David Nye writes, gas was not only a new fuel, it replaced sporadic and decentralised lighting with a centralised uniform system. By the 1820s, there was gas lighting in every major British city. And this new light source was created using coal at gas plants located in mainly working class areas. However, this process pollu produced pollution that adversely affected people living near the factories rather than the wealthier consumers of gas lighting. When the working classes gained access to an education at mechanics institutes, one of the questions that they sought to address was how to deal with pollution from these plants. This short paper examines politics and pollution surrounding gaslight through the minute books of the Glasgow Mechanics Institute, formed in 1823, and the Glasgow Mechanics Magazine. Now, the historiography of mechanics institutes usually begins with George Buck Beck's Saturday evening lectures to workers at Anderson's Institution in Glasgow in 1800. And this mechanics class, which ran for another 20 years, under the care of Andrew Ewer, then enabled a new class, the First Mechanics Institute, to be initiated by members of the working classes to emerge in 1823. And for many historians such as G.D.H. Cole, the 1820s were the seeding time of all great working class movements. Although few mechanics institutes were run by their own members as at Glasgow. Now, new institutes were founded around Britain and as Mabel Tylecourt writes, the English movement clearly owed its initiation to the Scottish example and even to the efforts locally of men of Scottish birth or training. So by 1820, there were 120,000 individuals at over 700 institutes in the UK alone. And this model of the Edinburgh and Glasgow institutes was soon adopted around the world. Now, on starting at Anderson's, um, Birkbeck was, um, he found himself trying to secure um, apparatus for his teaching. Um, Anderson had stipulated in his will that he didn't want any dealings with Glasgow University. And so Buck Beck scoured the workshops and he noted that they had frequent opportunities to see these, the, the intelligent curiosity of the unwashed artificers. Um, and he wondered why they were barred from knowledge. Was it because they were poor? Now, Birkbeck's sympathy became a driver for his free lectures to workers. 
And his first Saturday night lecture in the autumn of 1800 was to 75 people, the second to 200, the third week there were 300, and when attendance reached 500, um, in the fourth week people had to be turned away. Now after he left Anderson's in 1804, Birkbeck's successor Andrew Ewer continued the Saturday night lectures, and in 1805 he fitted gas lighting to the lecture theatre, and this was said to be the first time this lighting had been seen in Glasgow. And the Gaslight Chartered Company of Glasgow subsequently gave free gaslight two nights a week to the mechanics class and library at Anderson's in recognition of Ewer's groundbreaking innovation. The manager of the gas works, John Beaumont Nielsen, had studied at Anderson's and like Leonard Horner at Edinburgh School of Arts, was inspired by the mechanics class there. And in 1821, he opened a room with a small library that his gas workers could meet in and the gas company gave five guineas towards um, the upkeep of this room. Now, in the introductory address of the Glasgow Gas Workmen's Institution, which was published in the Thrutney Glasgow Mechanics magazine, you can see radical politics at work as the workmen attacked British class structures. And I'm going to read from this. So these gasmen said, no nation can be called rich merely because a few ancient families have annexed immense treasures to their overgrown estates. Nor can a country be famed for its knowledge, which is merely a few richly endowed seminaries, which would elevate the few by the oppression of the many. Now, political discussion amongst the working classes had been curbed by the Six Acts at the end of 1819, which, amongst other things, meant that pamphlets and papers containing any news, intelligence or occurrences, or any remarks or observations um, on any matter of church or state, could now not be sold for less than a sum of six pence. So, this sixpenny um, cost meant that Popular papers such as Cobbett's Political Register and Rulers Blank de Worth sank as the, the tuppence um, cost increased. So the aim of this act was quite simply to take papers beyond the means of the masses. And my argument is that the new mechanics institutes and magazines, which cost half of this amount, then became places for what in class politics to emerge. Now, I'm going to talk about the split of the, the, the Anderson's mechanics class. It might have appeared to you and the governors at Anderson's as ingratitude when, on the 10th of May 1823, the mechanics class carried the resolution to split. They didn't want to cut off their noses, though, as the minutes of the 10th of July showed that the newly divided class still wanted access to a library that you had lobbied hard for. But this break had been coming for some time. And after teaching the class for 20 years, you played a significant part in it coming. The year before the rupture, some of Ewer's pupils wrote to him scornfully about the quality and content of his teaching. Now, this is the worst student feedback you could ever want. We have been prompted to write to you, not by a desire to know whether tea, sugar or milk should first be put in our cups, what is the cause of our breath appearing in a foggy wintry season, nor indeed to ask so puerile and contemptible questions at a period of knowledge and refinement equal to the present. But I wish to remind you in a humble and polite manner of a promise which you gave in the last session of giving us a few words concerning lithography. Hmm. The class split, as I said, and after the split, as Thomas Kelly notes, the new Glasgow Mechanics Institute differed from Edinburgh in being thoroughly democratic in its organisation. The management of affairs was entirely in the hands of the mechanics, who at once proceeded to lease a hall appoint a paid lecturer in chemistry and mechanics, and to assemble a library and a museum of apparatus. Twin mechanics classes then existed, uh, with the one that Birkbeck set up in 1800, continuing with Ewer in parallel with the new Glasgow Mechanics Institute. And a split actually occurred in Manchester for the same reason. Um, Manchester Mechanics Institute started with a library um, in 1825 and a lecture series soon began with Andrew Wilson from Edinburgh School of Art lecture on mechanics and Richard Phillips in chemistry. However, this institution, like Anderson's, broke over the curriculum and the running of the place and a new Mechanics Institute was formed in 1829 led by Roland de Rossiter and that ran until 1835. 
So keeping people in their place and addressing the division of labour seems to have been issues that led to the breakup. These splits at Glasgow and Manchester attested tensions between paternalist governors and institutes and their members who wanted something more than an education that would improve them as workers. And J.W. Hudson writes that the universal complaint that mechanics institutions are attended by persons of a higher rank than those for whom they were designed began to apply um, from the 1830s. And this is something that Byron had warned about um, when he uh, pledged £50 to the London's Mechanics Institute, stating that unless all the offices in such an institute are filled with real practical mechanics, the working classes will soon find themselves deceived. They will only become the tools of others. So you get this tension in the institutes, and particularly in the contents of libraries, over what is deemed suitable by the governors and what the mechanics of the members, not all the modern mechanics, actually wanted. There was other opposition. Um, as Mabel Talcott writes, the new mechanics institutes were faced with persistent opposition from the Tory party and the Church of England. But it went beyond this. And you can see here um, a, a, a list of ministers um, going on about how bad these institutes are. A scheme more completely adapted for the destruction of this empire could not have been invented by the author of Revel himself. That sort of thing. But it goes beyond this. And during the radical post-war years, poor Waterloo years, there were informers amongst the clergy, including the Roman Catholic priest later bishop for Glasgow, Andrew Scott. And here you can see Gaslight is connected with a letter that he's written uh, to Lord Sidmouth about a, a rising that he thinks is going to take in Glasgow. He describes a plot he's heard about in the wake of the Cato Street conspiracy and he shares it with the Home Office. He says to Sidmouth, Glasgow is lighted with gas. The leading pipes from the gasometers are to be cut all at one time that the town may be thrown into darkness. Some hundreds of the malcontents are already in possession of pistols, a number of pikes. I've my information from those who saw the pistols and who saw the pike heads. The pike heads were made in the Carlton of Glasgow by a smith. But he doesn't write to the Glasgow authorities, he writes directly to London because he fears for his life. To drag me before an open court of justice would ruin my character, prevent me from ever receiving any information and expose me to be murdered. So, the new Mechanics Institute. So, moved on from this mechanics class at Anderson's. Here's a, a library class ticket. And they began to write their own questions. Now, questions set by the new Glasgow Mechanics Institute between 1823 and 1835 mix practical and written assessments and speak to the desires and conditions people working and living in industrial areas faced. There were questions of whether it would be more advantageous to society if less of the time of the generality of young men were devoted to the study of dead languages and more to the study of the laws of nature. There were other practical assignments such as how to make a cheaper clock, um, cheaper than the one that currently came from Germany. But there's this question on economy and air pollution. There's a gold medal for the best essay in the manufacture of gas for lighting towns and factories, which regards economy, quality, and the means of protecting from offensive effluvia those who live in the neighbourhood of the works where the gas is made. Now this question about lighting economy and quality finishes with an environmental problem that shows concern for the community who live near a gas works. Now they use the word effluvia, which means to flow out and OED it says it's an ex exhalation affecting the sense of smell and producing effects that are received into the lungs, chiefly a noxious or disgusting exhalation or odour. And this term in the period was mainly applied to vapours which had a, a morbific character and effluvia was associated with cholera and typhus. Now one publication in 1828 noted that every coal gas establishment is more or less a nuisance to the neighbourhood in which it is situated. And that's a nuisance from which everyone flees as from a pestilence. So this is an issue that affects working class areas. But it's a new issue 
because coal gas was only first manufactured in Britain in 1792 by Ayrshire engineer William Murdoch, who then went on to light the Soho factory of Bolton & Watt in 1802, but the process produced much pollution. Once coal tar and ammonical liquor was removed uh, from the coal, gas was purified from hydrogen sulphide and hydrogen cyanide be passing it over beds of slate lime. And the resulting waste material, gas lime or blue billy, was often used as a building filler. In damp weather, the mix gave off toxic sulphur and cyanogen. So here you can see a question about the things that affected working class people people and this was a new thing in an educational institution and it jars with the actions of a government that was trying to restrict the knowledge economy. Now with time I could give other examples such as at the Sheffield Mechanics Institute where they highlighted the dust pollution um, suffered by grinders but that's outside the, the scope of this talk. What's notable about early 19th century attempts to address air pollution is that they came from working class educational institutions that emerged despite much government and church opposition. The Glasgow Mechanics Institute, run by its members, addressed the desires and concerns of communities living within the areas where factories produced things that benefited the wealthy at the expense of the health of the poor. So in this paper I've used Gaslight to frame a talk about working class political agency at an early mechanics institute. After outlining how liberal paternalism could cause splits in mechanics classes, I touched on opposition from bodies who were interested in maintaining a class system that must rely on liberal benevolence towards unenfranchised people. I then focused on how political marginalisation led to working class political issues finding an outlet in mechanics institutes and accompanying publications such as magazines. And I ended using Gaslight to illustrate how communities who were living with the effects of industrial pollution tried to find answers and ingenuity amongst their own mechanics class students. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much. That was a really, really rich, uh, rich paper. I enjoyed it a lot, and I have a lot um, I'd like to like to ask you. But um, I'm just looking in the chat here. So far, we've only got one um, question to you, John. I'm not sure if you can uh, turn your your video on so that we can see you. Great. Um, the one hi. The one question we've got um, from Patrick Corbett is: Can John answer the question? Joanna wanted to put to Patrick O'Farrell. In other words, this is a question about the working class politics and social reforms, differences between what we heard in the last paper in Scotland with what we are hearing in your paper, which also did look at Glasgow, but also looked at, at England. Yeah, th thanks for this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I loved that last paper of Patrick's and I thought, it, I, I thought you know, you, you arranged them well so that they, they sat quite nicely together. Um, I think in England, um, I suppose a bit like Edinburgh, you had these members of the, the middle or ruling classes really who, who decided, you know, who, who, who wanted to be paternalistic and be, you know, noblesse oblige, you know, we're going to help the working classes to, to improve themselves and to be a wee bit more like us. And that's certainly the model that you see in a lot of the Mechanics Institute archives that I've looked at down in England. And I've specifically looked at institutes in um, Ipswich and Sheffield and of course London as well and I think that you can you can most clearly see this through the contents of the libraries as Patrick had started to say all, all of these institutes had troubles over what the contents of the libraries would be and and you know the, the governors only wanted it to be things that were were there just to help them as workers to improve them as workers. So there were battles to even get Shakespeare in the library. Um, I switched the battle for three years just to get the works of Walter Scott in there. They get them in in 1833. It was the same in Manchester. Sheffield tried to get the works of Scott in as well. It took a while. So th there are real tensions in these institutes between what the workers want and they know what they want and what the governors, these liberal paternalistic governors think that they should get. And it's, yeah. It's the story of the British class system there. I don't know if that helps, but it's it's close to that. Glasgow's a slightly different model because it is run by the workers. And you can see that in the questions that they try and address. 
Okay, that's really, really interesting answer. We've got something in the chat from Michael Sanders. Great paper, John. We can all say, we can all clap that one. Could you say a little bit more about the ways in which mechanics magazines provided a space for working class radical politics in the aftermath of the six acts? Yeah, th thanks, Mike. And I'm really looking forward to your paper. Um, yeah, I mean, no paper with anything in the church or state that's more than two pages could be anything less than six pence. It had to be stamped. And, and as you know, that went on until 1855. So these magazines certainly got under the radar because in amongst the, the, the letters and articles on new technologies and, and certainly efficiency is there in a lot of these uh, magazines. You know, how do we make boilers more efficient? How do we make engines more efficient? How do we make roads better? There's all sorts of things about efficiency in there. But you get letters from members and it's a space for politics to emerge. When, when you're disenfranchised, when you don't have any political space, because obviously after Peter Lou and the Six Acts and then the crackdown with Cato Street and then the attempts to um, get some patronage through the Carolina field, that all ends. It seems as though there's a quiet period until you get the rise of chartism in the 30s and certainly where, where a lot of your work has been, Mike. So I think um, we can see in these magazines a continuing political engagement with the working classes. It's, it's a space for it to emerge what other um, avenues have been shut down. You can't peacefully protest anymore. There is no access or, or very little access elsewhere to express yourself politically. And, and I can see it through these magazines. And oddly, there are people who rise up again in the 30s that you can see in these magazines, people like um, Francis Macaroni. You know, he, he, he fought um, on the side of Napoleon. He's a Mancunian Italian. And he'd fought there. And he's a, he's a revolutionary of the post-Waterloo period. But in the 20s, he's writing to mechanics magazines about how to um, improve roads and about his steam carriage. But by the 30s, he's produced something called Defensive Instructions for the People, which by 1831, which will show you how to make bullets, bombs, acids. Um, and he's a very dangerous man in the eve of the Reform Bill. So you can see that in some ways you could argue that mechanics magazines could give you a gateway to more radical literature. Um, that would certainly still be banned. Yeah thanks, thanks. yeah, thanks very much. And certainly I see that in terms of the, the London Mechanics Institution. Um, Ellen Coates um, says, was this, asks, was this different ethos reflected in mechanics institutions that were founded from, from the Glasgow model, like daughter houses of monasteries? So, um, sorry, could you repeat that again? Was it reflected? I think what the, the question is, is that the, the ethos that you're talking about, does, does the different ethos that is coming out of the Glasgow model, um, how, is that, how does that spread more widely? Um, so in the, I, I was fortunate that I got a, a week to spend in the um, Strathclyde University Library, um, and they've got the minute books to the Institute, and in amongst that there are letters from a number of other institutes um, asking, you know, how, how did you do this? You know, how did you set up yourself? And there's letters from America, from Philadelphia, and, and there's certainly a link with Philadelphia anyway, and, and America through Anderson and, and Benjamin Franklin, you know, they're, they're both, you can see in the earlier stuff, you know, that they're both very interested in education. And that, that kind of goes on, that, that flavour of that goes on. So there's letters from America, certainly, um, to the Glasgow Institute to see how it can be done and the way that they've done it were the members set it up themselves. And there's, there's letters from other institutes in England um, looking for advice. So I think that, that that thing about, you know, you know, you know as somebody that lives in a particular area, that is a particular kind of job, that is a particular kind of uh, prospects ahead of you, that the division of labor has decided that you're in a particular space you, you know what you what you need rather than the people who tell you what you need and dictate to you what you should learn. So I can see I can see the ethos spreading in, in that way and, and certainly abroad. But I think more more work needs done in that. And I think it's it's slow work that because you really need to go through the, the minute books and institutions to find out references to letters and elsewhere. That that is very none of it's digitized and it's all handwritten. But um I have I have found it certainly. Great, thanks. 
We've got just two minutes left, so I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and ask one myself because I was really fascinated by your broader um, project on engineering romanticism. And so in relationship to that broader project, can you say something about metaphor, um, about gaslighting? Um, you know, shedding light into where there used to be darkness, but also, of course, causing disease through miasma and toxic fu um, fumes. So can you just tie in very quickly, because I say we've just got two minutes, the metaphorical elements of gaslighting? I think there's a problem in new technologies, isn't there? It's like, who, who controls them? Because obviously they can be there for great good. Um, and, and gaslight certainly could be when, when, when you're puts gaslighting and these workers on a Saturday night, you know, they've got they've got light there, they can see and and it transforms things. I'm currently editing um Pierce Egan's Life in London, which is also from 1820, 1821. And what's remarkable in it is how some of the, the working class taverns have already got gaslights in them. You can see the working classes as, as the early adopters in the technology. But of course, the main beneficiaries are the people in wealthy areas. And the people who, who live in the West and the people who live in the East, where the wind blows towards, they got all the pollution. They're the people that have to deal with that. And, and I think that, I mean, I've been currently working on, um, and it's related to the steamships and Shelley and, and, and Peacock, I'm working on that right now. And, and Shelley's real concern is, how is this technology going to be used? He's desperate to embrace it. He's trying to build his own steamship, but to what end will it be used? Um, and certainly when Peacock makes them, they're going to be used in the first Anglo-Chinese war, he invents the first gunboats. So that's the thing about new technology. It can be used for, for good and tremendous things for humanity, but it can also be used to oppress. And you can see that in these early technologies, people like Richard Roberts, the brilliant Mancunian engineer, who, who was at Peterloo and, and, and was badly affected by it. He actually held back some of his inventions because he didn't want them, he said you know, the, the capitalist class to oppress people with them. So, so there's real tension over, well, how can this be used? And yeah, and pre marxies you know, the owners of the means of production. It's, it's a bit more than that. Yeah, great. There is actually one more question. We've got one minute left, so I'm going to quick, but it's a great question, so I'm going to just um, put it to you. It's from Steve Warren from Sydney. Given the example of the Institute's role on addressing gaslighting and its environmental issues, should institutes now be active in contributing to debates and solutions on climate change and plastic pollution? That's a big question. You've got one minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I mean, I think that, I think that we educational institutions survive through taking chances and doing new things and, and pushing, pushing always rather than going back or deciding what people should learn and always pushing forward and, and taking a risk with things and yeah, and shaking things up and yeah, of course, I, of course, I think, I think they should. I think that the same questions that I see there about efficiency and economy, especially in those early patterns that are there, none of that's gone away. And, and when new technologies come through, it's like, what are the, what are the consequences, often unintended, that are there as well? And, and certainly in new technologies in the real time, there are unintended consequences, whether it's come back to the nuclear industry or whatever it is, it's, there are things that are there that we have to attend to. And I think that our kind of institutions where we teach and work, we, we can talk about that and we can talk about that in relation to the subjects that we teach. Thank you so much. That was really fantastic, uh, John. I uh, really appreciate um, that. And also, I think the discussion, we're now getting into you know, a discussion about some of these really big questions that the whole conference is going to be addressing. Thanks very much.